On December 27, 1942, two trains collided at the Almont train station. The Pembroke Local, as it was known, was full of passengers returning from Christmas holidays back to Ottawa after spending time with their families here in the Ottawa Valley. Most of the passengers, in fact, on that train were from Ottawa Valley towns, Pembroke, Petawawa, Renfrew, Arnprior. The local was struck by a troop train loaded with soldiers. 36 people were killed on that night. More than 200 were injured. Mac Beattie, who you just heard, a well-known musician, later wrote and recorded the song about that fateful night. With us tonight is Melissa Alexander. She is the project coordinator of the North Lanark Regional Museum, and she will tell the story of the Almont train wreck. Welcome to Pembroke, Melissa. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here. I'm really looking forward to this evening. And I don't know about you, but I'll be back for the Flying Bandits, so. <laughs> so I wanted to start off by um, just talking a little bit about how the, thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so how the, um, uh, just the North Lanark Historical Society. So the North Lanark Historical Society was founded in 1965 and they actually own and operate the North Lanark Regional Museum, which is in Appleton, uh, the village of Appleton. I'm not sure if anybody's been, it's very scenic. Um, and that is now a part of the municipality of Mississippi Mills, which also includes Ramsey, Elmont, and Pakenham. Um, so the North Lanark Historical Society, um, they've been working over the years to commemorate the Elmont train accident. And in 1999, the society actually created a committee to look specifically at how they could commemorate the accident. At the time, there was no memorial in Almont. There was no marker at the site, uh, nothing. And even the train station itself had been demolished. It was demolished in 1979. So there was really nothing there um, to show the tragedy that had occurred. Uh, so they began fundraising for a memorial and reaching out to um, you know, family members, community members, witnesses, um, people who were there at the, for, uh, at the time of the wreck. So in 2002, uh, they commemorated the 60th anniversary of the Almont train accident with the unveiling of the monument. Um, and they also uh, published their first book on the accident, which is now in its fifth edition, and we actually have copies here available for sale. It looks a little bit like this. Anyways. Uh, and then 10 years later, in 2012, the Historical Society commemorated the 70th anniversary by holding a candlelit memorial. Um, and that was accompanied by music and storytelling. The storytellers were actually captured on video, and they later co-published a DVD with the Workers' History Museum and that uh, to, in order to showcase the evening for those who couldn't attend. So because it was the 70th anniversary of the accident, um, members of the Historical Society were very surprised when people attended who had actually been on the train, who had been a witness. And so this started a new round of information gathering um, where they did a lot of video interviews with survivors. And I'm actually going to be showing you uh, five video clips tonight with some of the survivors and witnesses um, from these interviews that the society has done over the years. So last year, 2017, marked the 75th anniversary of the accident, and the Historical Society has been lucky enough to receive a grant to create an online bilingual exhibit um, through the Virtual Museum of Canada, showcasing some of these memories. And um, we're also hard at work uh, writing a follow-up book with some of the additional research and stories collected over the years, so those should all be out this coming year. Anyways, today I'd like to showcase, um, I'd like to share just some of the research that's been done. So first, I'd like to begin with a very brief history of the accident. It was one of the worst accidents in railway history, and it occurred on Sunday, December 27, 1942. So like Jamie said, a troop train carrying Canadian soldiers for overseas service struck the rear of a crowded passenger train um, as it sat in Almond Station. It completely demolished the two rear coaches and most of the third coach. Uh, 36 died that, that night, but 
Three later succumbed to injuries, so 39 people in total, and over 200 were injured. So that's just a brief outline of the night. I'll be doing a brief history and sharing some stories and memories with you. And then at the end, I'll answer any questions you have. So let's start with the trains. Um, this is the Ottawa Valley Local, or the Pembroke Local. It was a regular passenger route that ran from Ottawa to Pembroke in the morning and Pembroke to Ottawa in the evening. It was, uh, this engine was a 34-year-old wood engine, and it was called the Cantankerous Old Hog. And while it typically had trouble pulling five coaches, because of the holiday crowds, it was pulling 10. And the, the last three coaches that were added were wood. They were wooden. Yeah. So this is the troop train. And the troop train, as I said, was carrying troops from Red Dealer, Alberta to Halifax in order to take troops overseas. The engine caboose and 13 metal coaches weighed over 1,000 tons. So that brings us to the Elmont train station and the accident. Um, on December 27, 1942, holiday crowds and poor weather delayed the local as it traveled through the small towns of Renfrew, Arnprior, Pakenham, and Elmont. The troop train, as I said, was on its way to Halifax where ships were waiting to take troops overseas, and it was on a tight schedule to make sure that they got there in time. And due to the war effort, uh, troop train schedules were actually kept secret. But the engineer and conductor of the train were both from Smith Falls, and they knew that the local was ahead of them. And they had been ordered to follow 20 minutes behind. Now, this was a very difficult task, because actually the troop train didn't have a speed gauge. Um, and so they had no way of knowing, and they also had no way of knowing how slow or how fast the passenger train was going ahead of them. They only knew when they arrived at a station that the passenger train had just left. So even though the troop train was held at both Renfrew and Arnprior stations, it was held for 20 minutes, um, it gained ground. So the Ottawa local finally arrived at Elmont Station at 8.32. And by this time, it was 40 minutes late. Typically, it only took a few minutes to load passengers at Elmont, but because of the holiday crowds, it took twice as long um, for all 200 passengers and their Christmas luggage to find their way aboard. So the inevitable crash occurred uh, just after the conductor gave the first whistle to proceed. So everyone was aboard, he gave the whistle, and that's when the troop train rounded the corner into Elmont. And the weather was very poor, but the engineer was able to see his headlights reflect off of the rear coaches. So he immediately put on the emergency brake. Um, but unfortunately, it was just too late. Unable to stop, the troop train crashed into the back of the passenger train. And the rear cars, as I said, were wooden. And they just burst. So it sent wood and metal debris flying. Um, the impact actually snapped the passenger train in half. And the front half of it went 50 meters down the track. So this is the Elmont train station. Unfortunately, it is no longer there. Um, and the impact would have occurred um, just right along there. So at the time, this was the second worst disaster in Canadian railway history. 36, as I said, died that night and three later from, three later from injuries. The fire siren alerted Elmont civilians to the chaos. And the first responders and soldiers from the troop train leapt into action, pulling injured civilians from the wreckage. Um, a four-car <coughs> hospital train was immediately summoned from Ottawa. Um, as you can see, this is the third coach from the rear. So the troop train actually came to stop about halfway through the coach. Um, local residents, including doctors and nurses, they brought aid and comfort to survivors. Doors of houses and tables were used as makeshift stretchers. Clothing and curtains were ripped up to be used as bandages. bandages. And um, when the 20 beds in the Elmont Hospital were filled, the O'Brien Theater, which you can see in the background here, right there, and right there, that's the O'Brien Theater. So that was actually, it became a temporary Morgan Hospital. And right in the middle of World War I, this was described by one survivor 
as the night the war came to Elmont. So how did this accident happen? So there were a number of contributing factors that led to the accident, some, upon I've, some I've touched upon already. So firstly, because it was the holiday season, there were more passengers than normal. So as workers headed back to Ottawa or Toronto for work on Monday, um, if the train had actually made it to Carleton Place, which was the next stop, uh, the front coaches of the train would have headed to Smith Falls, Rockville, Kingston, Oshawa, and finally Toronto, and the remainder of the train would have continued on to Ottawa. So because there were so many holiday passengers, the local took much longer at each st stop, and while the troop train was on an express route. Um, as mentioned earlier, the weather, it was also a factor. At the time of the, of the accident, it was raining and sleeting, uh, freezing rain, so that led to reduced visibility and made the tracks slippery. This caused the already slow passenger train to run even slower. Um, one one uh, witness described the terrain actually as a skating rink. So the troop train had a bigger engine and it was able to go much faster than the passenger train. Third reason is Pakenham Station. So the only other place the time gap between the two trains could have been corrected after Renfrew was Pakenham Station, which was midway between Arnprior and Elmont. Um, but because it serves such a small community, it was unmanned on evenings, weekends, and holidays. So when the agent went off duty that night, he set the light to a, to a reassuring green. Um, had he been there, it would have been red because the time gap between the two trains was shrinking so rapidly. So I don't know why he would have done that, but I guess maybe it was standard procedure. Um, and then geography was also a factor. Um, the train track actually curves as it enters Elmont, so the engineer could not see the station until it was about 135 meters away. By the time the passenger train was seen, it was just impossible to stop. Um, as it enters Elmont, the train track actually it also crosses over the Mississippi River, which you can see in these, uh, these historic postcards. Um, so the river creates mist, which also impacts visibility and the poor weather. So you can see the bridge in this postcard, and when the troop train actually came to a halt, part of it was still over the bridge. So to come to the aid of the passengers, the soldiers would have had to get out and carefully make their way across. Finally, compacting this, warning flares weren't used. So although the crew of the passenger train uh, did not know that a train was following behind them, it was standard procedure to use red or yellow warning flares on the back of the train if you were running behind schedule. Uh, so it just wasn't untaken, overtaken by another train. And unfortunately, for whatever reason, this just wasn't done. So a few more images. Um, this is another one from the scene. In the background, you can see O'Brien Theatre. And its doors were actually ripped off and used as stretchers. And then a modern view of the building, it's still there. Further tragedy came just, um, just a few days after the accident, when the conductor of the troop train, whose name was John Howard, he was reported missing by his son. He was later found in the Rideau River on January 6th, just one day before the official CPR inquiry was to begin. He had taken his own life by jumping off a bridge near his house in Smith's Falls. In a letter to his son, he wrote, God is my judge. I made no mistakes and I broke no rules, but I can't stand if they accuse me of causing 36 deaths. He was 64 years old and nine months from retirement. And he was not found at fault during the inquiry. Instead, the majority of the blame was actually placed on the CPR and the crew of the passenger train for not providing protection of the train. So if the rules had been followed, the passenger train would have used a red or yellow flare and there wouldn't have been an accident. Uh, the inquest also noted that the curve of the west approach to Elmont Station and the Mississippi River that caused the mist, so they also blamed them for contributing factors. And they recommended that the CPR should erect an additional signal west of the station to protect trains. So that was done. Um, the train accident claimed the lives of 39 people listed here and injured well over 200. 
So as the Historical Society has conducted research, we've spoken to many people, each with their own story to tell about the accident. So I'd like to take some time to share some of their memories and stories from that night. Um, the war shaped the accident in several ways. So war put the troop train on the tracks. War also meant that many of the passengers were young women who were headed to work in, in Ottawa or Toronto. Um, one of these women was Marie Green. Here's an image of Marie as a child with her parents and a photo from the time of the accident. In 1942, Marie was 22 years old and was working in Ottawa for the Woods Manufacturing Company. She had come home to Renfrew for, for Christmas, and on the night of December 27th, she boarded the local to make her way back to Ottawa for work on Monday. Um, she was killed in the accident. But the most haunting part of Marie's story actually comes from Marie herself. Just before Christmas, she had been feeling very blue. Two of her brothers were off to war. She was stuck in Ottawa, away from her younger brother and sister in Renfrew. And during this time, she wrote a letter to her friend Dawn. It's unclear if Dawn received this letter before or after the train accident, but he felt it was important to return it to Marie's parents. So it began, Dear Dawn, I'm absolutely dying with lonesomeness tonight, and I'm crying and I can hardly see, and you're the only one I want to tell it to. I wish Christmas were a million miles away. I've been wrapping presents and not having the kids around, trying to get a peek, is just making me sick. It's going to be awful with two boys away. Oh, I know I, not to be, I ought to be ashamed for even feeling like this, when so many sisters will never even see their brothers again, but I don't care. I guess I can be sorry and blue if I like. Maybe by the time I get this written, I'll feel a lot better. But everything just went wrong today. And then tonight, Bill called, and he isn't sure if he can get down for the dance. Gee, I'd wish I'd die. Then I'd spoil Christmas for the rest of the folks at home. I guess I can't wish that. So this is such a haunting letter, and you can only imagine how Marie's parents must have felt when they finally got it. The Historical Society was actually fortunate enough to interview Marie's younger siblings, uh, Pat and Gerard, who were 11 and 8 at the time. And they can still vividly remember how they heard the news of their sister's passing. So I'd like to play a portion of that now. And I apologize if there's bad sound quality. We'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, the local uh, parish priest had taken Mother and Dad down to Elmont because they still had no word about Marie. And uh, there was a snowstorm, bad weather. But they went down, and I remember Gerard and I were in the kitchen with my Uncle Jack. And uh, after a while, the, uh, another one of the priests came in, uh, Father Hass, and I remember his words very abrupt. We've, we've had word about Marie, she's dead. <laughs> and I, I guess we were crying, I don't remember, but we must have been. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I remember my neighbor came in and she immediately took down the Christmas tree and pulled it through the house to the back where my father had a workshop. And I thought, why is she doing that? And she said, your mother will not want to see this when she comes back. And I didn't quite understand why she couldn't, you know. And uh, after that, it's a little blurred. I remember them coming. No, I don't really remember them coming home. I remember my, uh, the neighbors, my first cousins, lived in uh, Cormac on a farm. In those days, they had the telephones where um, you rang a certain number for your farm and a certain number for another farm, and you're not supposed to listen in, but everybody did. That's how they got the local gossip. <laughs> so that's how the foreigns met my father's uh, sister, how they found out about it. Mm. And they must have come down then. I don't remember them coming down, but they must have been there. And then the next thing I remember, should I just continue then? Well, yes, if you want to, certainly. Well, the next thing, and George, you can fill in if you yes. remember any of No, you're doing fine. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Then the next thing I remember is um, the coffin coming in. Because everybody was um, waked in their homes at that time. Mm. And there was a lot of tears, and remember that crying. And uh, Marie's coffin was put in the living room. And uh, remember everybody crying. And I was crying, but I wasn't sure exactly why I was so sad, you know? Mm. The next thing I remember is the smell of roses. I hate the smell of roses to this day. Because there was... Um, 
a lot of the, you know, because of the accident, it was such a terrible accident, and so many in the town, there were a lot of flowers. And Marie worked for the Woods Manufacturing Company in Ottawa, or Hall, I don't know. But they sent a lot of flowers, all roses. And to this day, I don't like the smell of roses. I associate it with funerals. Yes, I can understand. And uh, I remember the tears. And I, one morning, I went down, and because there was always people there, but I went to touch Marie's head, and I touched the back, and there was nothing there. Mm. And I remember thinking, oh, that's awful. I wonder what happened to her brain. You know? Mm, things that but, you know, back then, Eleven was very young yes, for the times. So you didn't have any understanding of it. I didn't understand. The process. And that's... Um, I'll give you a break if you're getting yeah, perhaps okay. a little well, tired of talking, yeah. if you want. Yeah. And, uh, I was just going to ask you, Gerard. Sure. Yes, and what... I mean, Usually, you don't have the same recollections, and pretty much the different. same. Except um, I was eight; I just turned eight that summer, so quite young. Mm -hmm. And um, I do recall, as uh, Pat said, uh, our first knowledge of it uh, was when uh, the priest came in, and he was a little more abrupt, if I remember. <laughs> than that. His first words were, "Marie is dead." <laughs> and, uh, you know, I talk about diplomacy or <laughs> easing into it. Uh, yes, no and uh, for a young boy, uh, uh, I rem that stood out in my mind. And then uh, the next, uh, I do recall the uh, taking the Christmas tree out. That impressed me as well, very much so. And they didn't even stop to take the decorations off. Yeah, just... And that struck me, you know, why are they doing that, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, because death was something we were not familiar with, or I certainly speaking yeah. for myself, although the war was on and mm. people we knew, uh, the news of people being killed in war, but the first immediate thing of any death, that was the first for us and didn't really, really realize the significance of it. I wish I could have played you more, but <laughs> it's really, it gets a little bit funny because they talk about how Gerard... Marie always called Gerard sweetie pie, and then they laugh at that because Pat obviously doesn't think he was much of one. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> um, so uh, one thing also that I didn't get to play was, um, so almost one third of the victims from the train accident were from Renfrew, and that actually stood out to Pat and Gerard because at Marie's funeral, there were six other coffins there, not just hers. And because the ground was so cold, none of the victims could be buried until the spring. Um, so the next person I'd like to talk to you about is Marion Watt. Um, she was another survivor that we heard from. So like Marie Green, Marion Watt uh, was a young woman who had the opportunity to work in Ottawa because of the war effort. She grew up in White Lake and was working in Ottawa for the Navy during World War II. And on December 27th, she was headed back to Ottawa after spending Christmas with the family. Um, yeah, so sitting in one of the middle coaches, she remembers the big bang and being shoved into the seat ahead of her when the accident occurred. And her first thought was, what the blazes happened? And she found she couldn't get off the train because of the crowd. So she went to grab her luggage, but some luggage fell down on top of her and a soldier ended up helping her off the train. And she can remember that there were a lot of passengers lying on the ground and others on benches, so she went into the station. Um, she remembers being so grateful to all of the soldiers from the troop train who helped at the accident site and with the wreckage. And she ended up actually going to work the next day. But her boss sent her off when he, when he heard the news and gave her some money to see a show. He said, you should leave. And she said she went home, but she couldn't get her mind off the wreck, and so she ended up going back to work again on Tuesday morning. And no one said anything to her about it that time, but she just felt it was better for her to be working than sitting at home and thinking about it. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, when the, siren si when the siren sounded in Elmont, many of the residents leapt in to help. So one of these was Marion Jameson. And on the night of the 27th, Marion was actually holding a dinner party for her girlfriends. It was the holidays, lots of their husbands were overseas, and she wanted to do something cheerful, so they all had a formal dinner. Um, but their evening was interrupted by a phone call from the local doctor, Dr. James, and, because three of her friends were nurses. So he called and told them the news and said, you know, come and help and bring anyone who can hold a basin. 
So Marion was a secretary, but she ended up going along to help. And uh, she ended up being right in the thick of things. So I'd like to play you just a small excerpt of that night of her memories. So we're to, now what did you expect to see when you got there? Well, we really didn't have any idea. Uh, well, you know, you'd have an idea because they said, well, there were dead bodies lying uh, right beside the track. Um, because the, the troop train slammed into the back of the passenger local. train, the yeah. local, and there were bodies just like the, the trains were wooden then, and they just burst open, and there were people just scattered all, all over. It, well, it was horrendous, really, it was. Mm -hmm. I, I, well, I get did you, uh, Did you get to attend to some of them? And, oh, yes, and what yes. Did, what was the most severe injury that Well, the, the worst one was, as, as I say, the young chap, uh, and I think his name was Markham. He had internal injuries, mm -hmm. and I was, they gave morphine and, at that time, because we're waiting for the uh, hospital train, a train to come that would take the patients and bring them to That's the awesome. civic. Their Almont Hospital was overwhelmed, oh. uh, but... Um, uh, no, uh, I, I remember the young man because uh, he would be about the same age as my husband who was at that, that time overseas, but he had internal injuries and he, he died. I was holding him so to help him take the morphine and then mm -hmm. a lot of them were nauseated after the morphine yes. and they threw up and so I was holding him and he, he just he died when I was holding him. And I, I had never seen anybody die before. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was... So uh, it very dramatic for you? Very dramatic. Uh, it, very, very dramatic. And, and especially, I think, because of the age and his rank in the Army and everything, you know, it made you think, well, that could have been my husband. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. That's for sure. Yes. So it was a, a very... Uh, it was a very stressful experience, I have to say. One you never forget. No, I guess not. But on the other hand, the fact that, well, maybe, maybe it did a little bit to help. I think that's the end of that clip. <laughs> um, so it was amazing the number of people who came together that night and started helping. Doctors from Carleton Place, Perth, Arnprior, Smith Falls, Packenham, in addition to the local doctors who arrived on scene. Along with the O'Brien Theater, the entrance of the Elmont Hotel was used, and across the road there was a farm implement dealer with a large garage, so it was being used too. Local businesses joined in the fray. Uh, there was a local business, Martin's Plumbing. They had a Ford van, so that was used as an ambulance. The grocery store and the hardware stores were opened, and if any supplies were needed, people just went in and took something, no charge. And it was important to remember that this was during the war, so most things were rationed as well. Coffee, sugar, butter, meat um, for the war effort. So on uh, December 27th, uh, Bob Barkley was just 10 years old, and he can remember how his family helped with the effort that night. His three aunts were down from Toronto for Christmas, and they had just enjoyed a Christmas dinner at his grandparents, at his grandmother's house. And that's when the, the sirens started going and the bell at the Rosenman Mill started to ring, followed by the bells in all the churches. And in the society's interview with him, Bob describes how the fire sirens and the bells just kept going on and on, ringing and ringing and ringing, and he describes it as a screech. So they knew something had happened, and then the phone rang, and it was Dr. Kelly, one of the local Elmont doctors, and he was asking Bob's father to help with the accident. So his father, Thomas, had done all of his first aid training through St. John's Ambulance, and he was the first aid man and the superintendent, the superintendent at the Rosman Mill. So I'd like to play you a clip of Bob's memories from that night now. I was 10 years old, and I wanted to go and see what was going on, but they wouldn't let me. So, uh, I can remember uh, they called and asked uh, if my mother and her aunts and that, my aunts would uh, make sandwiches and coffee and hot soup and stuff 
and the firemen would come with the fire truck because they had chains on and, that, and they would pick it up and take it down. Yeah. And so that's what it did and it was, it was like a soup kitchen there from then until after midnight. Uh, I don't know how much because I got chased off to bed about midnight. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, my dad didn't come home until about six o'clock in the morning. And he was just home in time to change his clothes and uh, go off to work for seven o'clock at the mill. Uh, now he talked a bit about it later. Um, he said that there was a, an officer in the army carried off at the train uh, on a kind of stretcher thing, and he was laid on the platform. And of course, it's still raining and sleet. So Dad went and got his great coat, like the officer's great coat, and covered him up. Yeah. He also went somewhere and he found some piece of tarp or something to put over him. And he said to him, "Are you all right?" "Yeah, well, I'm fine," he said. And he said, uh, "He said I just can't walk, but I'm fine." He said, well, "You got pain?" "No, no." He said, "Is there anything you'd like?" He said, "I'd like a cigarette." So Dad smoked the time, and he got a cigarette out for him and lit it for him, and he said, thanks very much. So Dad went about his business, and he came back in about 15 minutes, and the fellow was dead. Oh, wow. Uh, um, so, although Bob hadn't been let out of the house that night, makes sense, um, the next morning he was still curious about the scene, and so he left with his dog the next morning at 8 a.m., and he remembers the large pieces of debris had been cleared, they had used a crane, so you can see some of the photos here of the cleanup effort. And he also remembers how the snow in the area around the platform in the station, he said it was so packed down, it was like cement from so many people walking on it. And he remembers what was in the snow, lots of dolls, teddy bears, shoes, suitcases that were broken open and Christmas presents just scattered. Another witness um, interviewed by the Historical Society, her name was Kathleen Thompson, and she can remember the Christmas presents as well, the Christmas wrappings at the scene. And um, similar to Marion Jameson, who kind of was forced to play nurse that night, um, she also went to the site to help, but she found that she wasn't, very, she wasn't really able to handle it, so she helped in a different way, which is actually very interesting. So I'm going to let Kathleen explain what she did to help out that night. It was uh, a Sunday night, I remember that. And usually in Almont, the younger people would go down to meet the train as it came in, just to watch it come in and go out, which was rather funny. But anyway, I was in about the middle of what we call the bay. I was going down to meet my friend Millie Willis, who worked in the Bell Telephone office. And when I was about halfway down, halfway across the bay, I heard this terrible bang and then steam flying and so uh, I thought there was something funny and then there was a lot of noise and yelling and everything but when I got up around West Corner to go up the main street uh, I uh, knew that something had happened at the station because there was a lot of running and yelling and but I went on up into the uh, Bell Telephone office Millie let me in, and it, uh, and then she knew that the train that there had been a train wreck. So uh, then the, the people started banging on the doors and the windows and wanting into the office, and uh, so I would open the door and see what they wanted. Well, they they really wanted to let their uh, relatives know that they were all right. So I would take down the addresses and phone numbers and. I stayed to help Millie. I knew a little bit about what went on in the bell office. <laughs> and uh, so that's what I did for quite a while. And then I went out because my sister was out there somewhere. And I went out to see, see where she was. And uh, I knew she was helping. And uh, I went out up to the O'Brien Theater where they were taking a lot of people. And uh, that was really a bad spot because people were dying and everything else. And, but I did help a little bit and uh, you had to put 
the doctors would give you something and you wrote on their forehead what was wrong with them so that they would check and they'd know whether to take them to a hospital or what to do. And then after that, I went out and I went across to the Alamo Hotel. It, uh, not a very big, it wasn't a big hotel or anything, but I helped in there for a while, like with the people on stretchers. And, and um, then I decided this just wasn't for me, this kind of work, so I went back to the uh, telephone office right. and stayed in there for, oh, a long time. And, uh, but I, I do remember all the um, Christmas papers blowing around on the you know, all over that corner by the uh, O'Brien and the Alamo, and then they did take some, I think it was to the Orange Hall, I wasn't over there, but it was those three places. And, uh, oh, there was a lot of noise and steam and people shouting and yelling, and it, it really was a terrible night. Um, interestingly enough, Kathleen's sister, who she was talking about, how, um, she mentioned, her name was Ruth, and um, she was actually helping at the O'Brien Theater. And when Ruth got home that night, she said, I know what I'm going to do. I want to be a nurse. And she became a nurse. So that night changed people's lives in some very unexpected ways. Um, as I stated earlier, many of these stories came to the society because of the 70th anniversary in 2012. And so one of the survivors that attended the event was Bernard Turcott, and I'd like to share the story of his family. So in the summer of 1942, Maurice and Cecile Turcott were the proud parents of Bernard, who was age five, and Denise, who was born in April. Over Christmas, the family traveled to Petawawa to visit Maurice's mother. Um, Maurice was actually a cab driver in Ottawa, and he had to return to work on Monday morning. So that night, that Sunday, December 27th, the family found themselves sitting in the rear of the last coach in the, uh, of the Ottawa local. And they had made friends with the O'Brien family who were sitting across from them, and they were laughing back and forth and singing Christmas carols. And just as the train was about to pull away, Bernard asked his mother, can I go look out the back so I can see the train pull away? And so he got a look out of the back door, and he saw the large light coming towards them, and he asked his mother what it was. And before she could answer, there was the massive impact. Um, his baby sister, Denise, who was only nine months old, was killed. Um, and then Maurice, Cecile, and Bernard were all very seriously injured. The entire family was tossed from the wooden coach. Maurice and Bernard were thrown near each other, and they were both picked up by rescuers and brought to the home of Mr. and Mrs. Illingworth in Elmont. And Bernard can still remember waking up in, on a cement floor of somebody's basement. On Monday morning, all three were taken to the Ottawa Civic Hospital by train. Um, Cecile was not in the same coach as Maurice and Bernard. And Bernard remembers chatting to other passengers, and he got some quarters and some peppermint lifesavers, so he still remembers that. And due to the extent of their injuries, which were, they were, their legs were broken and fractured in multiple places, they were all forced to call the Civic home for the next six months. Um, so Bernard remembers that the first week was a complete blur. All were drugged to help with pain and recovery, and Cecile actually wasn't told of the death of her daughter for two days following the accident. And due to the injuries, none of them were able to attend the funeral. They were also kept on different floors of the hospital, so Bernard was in the children's ward, his mother was in a women's ward, and his father was in you know, the men's ward. And so it was almost a month by the time the family was actually able to see each other. Physically, Cecile was in the best condition. Um, Maurice uh, Bernard describes her as the type of person who could chat with anybody. So she spent lots of time with her fellow patients, and she made a lot of close friends there. Um, they always played cards. One of them, Lila Barr, she was actually recovering from the train accident as well. Um, Maurice and his son Bernard, they were much worse off. So sitting in the hospital the first week, uh, the CPR's doctors arrived and told Maurice that both he and his son would never walk again. Um, but as Bernard describes, his father was a very scrappy figure. Um, he was a real fighter. So in response, Maurice quickly contacted a well-connected lawyer that he had recently done some repair work for. Um, and he had become quite good friends with him. 
So his lawyer went to work with a firm from Toronto to pressure the CPR for better health care and for financial compensation. Uh, the case never went to court, and the family received a cash settlement in excess of $40,000, which is almost $600,000 today. So better doctors were brought in for the Turcotts and both walked again without any problems. Um, but because of this, Bernard speaks of the accident as having both positive and negative effects on the family. The death of his sister was obviously horrific, but the cash settlement um, allowed the family to move to a better neighborhood. They were in a tenement before, and then they moved to uh, the Glebe in Ottawa. And it also paid for Bernard's education. Um, two years later, Cecile gave birth to a son, Richard, and this is a photo of the family in 1946. Um, the next person I want to talk about, um, sorry, let me backtrack. The Turcotte's compensation, it seems to have been a rare exception. Many didn't receive any at all. Um, and one of the survivors who was very involved in the Historical Society's reachers is Ed Muldoon. He was 15 at the time of the accident, and he was on the third coach from the rear with his cousin, Eileen. It was their first train ride, and uh, Ed had been hoping to sit in the very back because uh, he thought it would sway like the streetcars in Ottawa, so he was really looking forward to that. Um, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> um, the coaches were packed, so they both ended up in the third coach from the rear. And Eileen somehow managed to snag a seat while Ed stood in the aisle. When the troop train struck, Ed describes it, he thought it was a bomb going off. He said everything was gone in an instant. Suddenly, he and his cousin were buried under the debris. Um, and they somehow managed, they were unhurt, but they were buried for almost five hours until rescuers were able to dig them out of the wreckage. Uh, Ed and his cousin were put on the hospital train to Ottawa, and he remembers two CPR representatives boarding and insisting that he and his cousin and others on board sign a waiver form exonerating the company. Um, so 15 and very shaken, obviously, he did sign, and likely there were many more who did as well. Um, although he wasn't injured, the accident has stayed with Ed all his life. He's 90 now, um, but up until a couple years ago, he used to visit the site of the accident twice a year. He felt it was a form of therapy. And he's actually been very instrumental um, in contacting other survivors of the accident, and he's done quite a few interviews on behalf of the society. Um, so the final clip I'm going to show you is an interview Ed took part in with Douglas Snare. Um, and he ended up being in the same coach as Ed during the accident. Uh, unlike Ed, Doug, uh, Doug got out of the coach right away, and the only injury he sustained was the broken crystal in his watch. So we can see them talking about the accident. The sound on this one, I think, is a little... Let me know if you can... Let me know if there are any problems. Uh, I'd been to uh, Renfrew uh, to spend Christmas with the girlfriend that I was going with at the time. And uh, we were coming back, of course, on the train mm -hmm. and stopped in the station in Elmont. And uh, then, of course, the troop train came and smashed into the back of us. And, uh, mm -hmm. Which coach of the three on the rear, which one were you in? The one nearest the engine. The we were the lucky th ones. The, the other two completely demolished. Yeah. So you were in the and, third. Uh, yeah. The train was just starting to come in to the end of our coach, actually. Right after we got up off the floor where, where we were, <laughs> when we were uh, hit, we were, of course, uh, forward into the seat ahead of us and that sort of thing. Uh, I got up and I looked and the first thing I saw was a big yellow headlight of the engine and the front part of the engine just coming into our coach just stopped mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. We were very fortunate. Yes, because it was a, a bigger engine than the engine that was pulling our train. Oh, we were in the third coach. Oh yes, this was a yeah. big Continental, big, the big engine. Type 2800, thing. yeah. That headlight, uh, I was in that same coach as you, but we were thrown right up to the other end of the coach. That right. And, and covered up with junk. We were about five hours before they got us out of there. 
But there's another lady in uh, Renfrew that we interviewed, and she remembers the light. And it wasn't even broken, that part of it. It was on as if it was never near an accident. The lens wasn't broken, nothing. Uh, we, uh, the only thing that happened to us, of course, was I uh, broke the crystal of my watch. Oh. That was all. Yeah. And we were uh, cushioned pretty well by the seat ahead. We hit it. And I think, it, if I remember correctly, it broke off. But the, and the people ahead of us then were underneath it. And That's we, all, we all got up and checked and uh, no injuries. So mm -hmm. that was it. Well, then uh, the next thing was to get out of there, of course. And, uh, I, uh, I got my girlfriend out on the platform and, and then went back to see what was going on, see mm -hmm. if I could help other people as well. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I, uh, there were some injuries in the car. I could hear people calling and so on. I, Mainly from the luggage was in the, the uh, racks overhead, mm -hmm. and it had fallen and hit some people and so on. Yeah. But uh, I don't know how badly they were injured. I I didn't attempt to help them because I didn't know I might make it worse. Well, that's and the trouble. Yeah, you know, we were stuck. We were under a bunch of seats and stuff, and we couldn't move. Is that right? You're afraid to move because you might be bleeding. You know, yeah. you couldn't tell. So it was, it was way too, about four hours when we got us out. Is that right? Yeah. We were, uh, we were very good. We were mobile and out of there in 15, 20 minutes or more. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Must have been quite a sight when you got outside and see all the Well, wreckage. I didn't realize at that time that we had, the engine had gone through three cars before they hit us. Mm -hmm. Or two cars, rather. It wasn't until I got out on the platform and walked back to see what was happening that I saw all the debris and the, uh, the stuff there, and people yeah. lying around. It was an awful sight. So we didn't see that because we couldn't get out. No, that's right. So I'm glad I didn't see it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was, and the cries of people and screams and that sort of thing. So I never forget that. Well, it was. Um, so one other interesting thing I wanted to note about Doug Snare um, is he's one of he's actually one of the last survivors of the Halifax explosion. So he's yeah he's a, he's still living he's 101 um, and he was one and a half years old when the explosion killed more than 2,000 people and that was December 6, 1917. There's actually was a recent article written about him in the Ottawa Citizen. Um, so I highly recommend you, you just Google it and look it up. And um, he actually said in that, in that interview, I've just been in the right place at the wrong time. Um, so one of the last things I wanted to end on a happy note. Um, so I wanted to share with you a love story. So in 1942, Matt Crozier was working in Toronto. On Christmas Eve, he borrowed the train at Union Station to head home to Renfrew for the holiday uh, with his family. It was already busy, so he took the very first seat next to the steps. And as he was arranging his coat and his gloves and a small parcel in the luggage rack, he noticed a blonde woman um, having difficulty getting up the, the steps, and she was nearly smothered, he said, under all her parcels. So he lent his assistance to the woman, whose name was Nora Pennett, and she thanked him for his help. But by then, the holiday crowd had just swarmed the coach, and all the seats were taken, uh, except for Max. So he invited her to share his seat for the trip. So the time flew by. As they pleasantly chatted about their lives in Toronto, they exchanged addresses. And when they reached Smith Falls, Nora gathered everything together to change stations to head for Perth. And they were both headed back to work on Monday, so Max said if she didn't mind, he'd watch for her at the station, um, you know, at the station in Smith's Falls for the return journey. And she said, I'll look forward to seeing you then. Merry Christmas. So on Sunday night, uh, Mac boarded the train for Renfrew. The weather was bad, the train was crowded, and he got on the coach right behind the engine, which would 
later detach at Carleton Place and continue on to Smith Falls. So sitting at the station in Elmont, Mac heard the signal for the train to carry on its journey, and then all of a sudden, the huge bang. All the luggage fell, the windows shattered, and he saw a great gap open where the conductor of the train had stood just a moment before. So the engine, the baggage car, and the first two coaches had taken a terrific slam, and the train had split in two, and Mac's part had moved 50 meters up ahead on the track, and the other half lay behind him in shambles. Um, at 11 p.m., Mac was uninjured, um, and then at 11 p.m., another train came, and he was able to continue on to Carleton Place and then on to Toronto. So Mac arrived in Toronto early Monday morning, and by this time, the newspapers were already carrying news of the accident. So columns of names of the deceased and injured filled the front pages, and it was already being described as one of the worst accidents in railway history in Canada. Um, Mac and Nora's story can be found in the train accident book, so I'm going to be reading an excerpt. So all that journey, the overnight trip to Toronto, Mac Crozier wrestled with a problem. He had promised to be looking out for the blonde Miss Pennant at Smith Falls on the return trip, and he had been unavoidably prevented from fulfilling that promise. It seemed to him only elementary courtesy to want to offer a mild apology and calm any distress that she might be feeling, wondering why he hadn't looked out for her at Smith Falls. On the other hand, thought Mac, if she happened to have the newspaper delivered to her door, she might be wondering if he had been killed or injured beyond repair. So though it was still early in Toronto, he took the streetcar up Young to Bloor, transferred to another line, and walked from the car line to the address he had jotted down just three days before. He knocked at the front door and waited. A girl came to answer the knock. Excuse me, said Mac, would Miss Pennant be in? Yes, she is, but just who are you? Mac Crozier. Mac Crozier, the girl shouted. You can't be. My sister says you must be dead. We've been looking for your name in the list of people killed in that awful train wreck. You're supposed to be dead. <laughs> so less than a year later, Mac and, Mor Mac and Nora were married, and they later returned to Renfrew, where Mac worked for the Canada Post. They had five children. Um, another interesting thing to note is that Mac and Nora's children never knew any of this. Uh, they knew Mac had been in the accident, but that was the extent of it. Uh, so Mac's story it was actually one of the first recorded by the Society. He was interviewed in 2000, um, and his story was included in the first book published in 2002. So they only learned the story when one of their daughters, Gail, came to the memorial in 2012, and she was told about the book. Um, so luckily enough, the Historical Society was fortunate enough to interview Gail, and she's the one who provided us with all the pictures. Um, this story is a really important lesson in preserving and recording these memories, and that leads right into my next point, which is that if anybody here has any stories of the Elmont train accident, uh, please let me know. We'd be very interested, and we'd love to learn more. And with that, that was the presentation. So.